way, God should give his only son well, that we could have eternal life. And 
greater things are still to be done in this city. Greater things have yet to come, and greater things are still to be done here. We believe, we believe in you, God. Greater things have yet to come, and greater things are still to be done in this city. Greater things still to be done here. Still to be done passion for prayer. It is amazing how people can be so passionate about many things in life. I never realized how passionate people can get over a mask. I never realized how passionate people can get over football. I never realized how passionate people can get over politics. It's a simply amazing thing. And how passionate people can get over religion. Not Christianity, but religion. So I don't know what your passions are in life. You might have a hobby you're passionate about. You might have an interest you're passionate about. I always admire those that are passionate about collecting stamps because it seems so boring. But I guess you could be passionate over that as well. But I believe as individuals who follow the, way, the ways of the Lord, we need to be passionate about our prayer life. And it is my contention that most people are not passionate about their prayer life. They may pray. A few minutes here, a few minutes there, but to be passionate, to come in communion with the living God is something that I think we need to work on. And we're going to work on that today a little bit. So if you're in the book of Luke, you're all there in chapter number 11? In verse number one, it came to pass that as Jesus was praying in a certain place that he ceased, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. Now you have to ask yourselves, why would men who grew up in a Jewish home ask about prayer? Because they prayed diligently. They went to the temple and prayed. The men had to go there three times a year to come before God. And of course, they went to the synagogues or the local assemblies in between time. So uh, they knew about prayer, and they were undoubtedly men who did pray. But they saw something in Christ that they realized was different. His prayer life is different than how we are praying. And of course, what made the difference was that Jesus was in personal communion with his Father, as opposed to just a rhetorical prayer that was maybe that was sometimes written down and other times was just kind of uh, off the cuff, but it was very flowery, you know, our Heavenly Father, great art thou God, and greatly have done wonderful things and how you have blessed us, etc., etc., which is a lot different than having a passion and saying, oh God, John at work needs Christ. Give me wisdom to be able to speak to him. Give me the courage to speak to him. It's a vast difference between those two, two types of prayer. But notice he begins what is commonly called the Lord's Prayer which is really the disciples' prayer because he's teaching them this. But Jesus said to them, When you pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so on earth. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now let's pray. Father, we come before you today, we come before your word, we come before a portion of scripture that deals with prayer. And I know, Father, that all of us, if we're totally honest with ourselves, would recognize the fact that our prayer life needs to improve. 
Not simply in length of time, though that's probably the case in most instances, but that our prayer life would improve because we are communicating with you rather than simply going down a list or saying the same thing each and every day, even for our family members, our children, or our parents, and simply saying the same things instead of getting into the details. So, Father, I ask you to help us to become passionate about our prayer life. That we would recognize that time spent in prayer is time well spent. And in fact, as we noticed in Sunday school today, now we've mentioned China, or we've mentioned Ukraine. But Father, there are places around the world that need our prayers. There are people who are our brothers and sisters in Christ that are suffering and going through difficult times that need great grace. We have missionaries that we support we need to be praying for them regularly, if not each and every day, for their hardships and their difficulties. And now with the war in Ukraine, prices are escalating not just here in America, but elsewhere. So people are having struggles. People in our church, I'm sure, are beginning to have financial struggles. So Father, let us be a people that don't count it a waste of time it will not allow the flesh, nor the devil, nor the world and its pressures keep us from going into our prayer closet and spending time with you. Forgive us, Lord, of the sin of prayerlessness, for you have done great things for us. And we always claim, and proudly so, that Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship with you. Now what kind of a relationship would two human beings have if they rarely spoke to one another or said the same thing to each other all the time? Father, please, in this dark hour, let us be a people of prayer. There's much to be prayer, praying about, and we need to engage and in praying for people, for situations, for circumstances, for the health of folks, and for all those things that come into people's lives. We ask that you would speak to our hearts today through the Holy Spirit. And Father, if there's one person here that's never come to Christ, might you give them no peace until they find that peace that comes through Jesus and knowing you. And I pray it in his wonderful name. Amen. Amen. True story. Way, way, way long ago, a woman, her name was Betty Travis. Betty Travis was driving a 1956 Chevrolet. Collectors, I don't know. Broke down. She had her five-year-old son in the car. She said to her five-year-old son, you need to pray. And he did. Lord, help this hunk of junk to start. <laughs> now, that's getting down to the point, is it not? Sometimes we need to get down to the point. But let me point out a few things about this Lord's Prayer. And we recognize it as an outline to prayer, not something that you would just say over and over and over again without any thought. Oh, you can say it indeed and really mean it in your heart, and God, of course, would be blessed by that. But I believe when you say the same thing over and over again, it just becomes rote. And of course, Jesus said, uh, don't be like the heathen that just repeat the same thing over and over again. Talk to God. But notice what the Lord is saying here in this passage. It's a corporate prayer. You say, what do you mean, Pastor? Well, we can tell by the pronouns here, when you pray, say this, our Father. Now when I pray, I always say Father. But I don't say Our Father because it's just me in the room alone. It would be kind of weird if I said Our Father. So this is a corporate prayer for the church. 
Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, your will be done in heaven or on earth as in heaven, as it says in Matthew. Give us this daily, uh, day by day, our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that's indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. So the disciples as a group came and they said, Now Lord, teach us to pray. And he said, Well, when you pray corporately, when you guys get together and pray, pray after this fashion. And of course, honor the Lord first. And of course, ask God to give you your needs for the day. They didn't have a stop and shop or all these back then. And forgive us of our sins as we forgive those that are indebted to us or have sinned against us. And then, of course, he ends up and lead us not into temptation. Now, all of this, if you will, is a prayer that is proactive, not reactive. You say, what do you mean by that? What I mean is when we react to things in life, we don't pray and say, Lord, don't lead me into temptation. That's a proactive prayer. Reactive is you've sinned, and now you're going to God and saying, God, forgive me of my sin. So this is proactive. Notice there's no thanks in this prayer. And one of the most important aspects of prayer is thanksgiving. It says over and over again in the scriptures, in everything, give thanks, give thanks. And so uh, we know that thanksgiving is a part of prayer, yet in this prayer, it's not there. Because this prayer is proactive to pray that something will take place, that something will happen, if you will. So here the Lord is giving this prayer to his disciples and asking them to understand that this is something they ought to pray because they're going to be going into the world without Jesus. And they're going to literally change the world. And there's going to be a lot of opposition. Now, Dave mentioned opposition today in the world around us. I don't know if you've noticed it, but in the past 30 years, there's been a lot of opposition against Christianity right here at home. In fact, they can't even call it trans world radio anymore. That is, uh, talk about uh, what a day we live in. Um... I want to ask you a few questions. You answer these. Don't answer them out loud. Unless you're really under conviction. But let me ask you a couple of questions. Number one is this. Is prayer really worth the effort? Is it really worth the effort? Now all of you are probably saying, oh yes, it's worth the effort. So the next question would be, well, how much effort are you putting into it? If it's really worth the effort, how much effort are you putting into your prayer life? Let me ask this question. Would your prayer life inspire anyone else to pray? How inspirational is your prayer life? <coughs> hmm. Well, you say, Pastor, you have to pray out loud for anybody to know. Not necessarily. You can be caught praying silently in your home on a regular basis. The kids could go by a door and say, oh, dad's praying again. Oh, there's mom, she's praying again. Or you train them when they're little. Shh, mom and dad are praying. Would your prayer life inspire anybody else? Or is it something so secret that nobody even knows about it? Well, Jesus said to go in your prayer closet, don't tell anybody. But I think that when you go in your prayer closet, people in the household should know you're in your prayer closet. And the last question is this. Can you name the last five prayers that God has answered for you? Can you name the last five prayers that God has answered for you? Well, all I'm saying is we need to have a passion for our prayer life. But let's continue here in this portion of Scripture. Verse number five. And Jesus said this to them as an illustration of how God will answer their prayer. Which of you 
shall have a friend and shall go to him at midnight and say unto him, Friend, let me three loaves of bread, obviously, for a friend of mine in his journey has come to me and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, my friend. The door is now shut. My children are in bed with me. I cannot rise and give you. And I say unto you, Though he will not rise and give him, because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity. You say, what does that mean? His insistence. As a friend, sometimes friends don't even respond. Hey, I need your help. This is the clencher. Do you really want to know who your friends are? Hey, I'm moving. Can you come help me move? <laughs> the people that show up are really your friends. But he's saying, not because of his friendship, but because he kept troubling him. In verse number 8, Yet because of his importunity, his insistence, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. So what does he go on to say? He goes on to say this. And I say to you, ask, and it shall be given unto you. So Jesus said we should always be praying. Now here's what we want in our prayer life. You pray at once and God answers. Anybody want that? Don't lie. Don't lie. That's what we all want. I pray at once, they're saved. I pray at once, and the money comes in. I pray it once, and the situation is taken care of. How many have noticed that rarely, if ever happens? Why? Well, there are several reasons, but one is, that you might not think about, one is that maybe God just wants to hear from you more frequently. We have to remember God is not a genie. He's not, a, you know, you rub the prayer lamp and he answers the prayer and poof, great. That's it. I live my life. When I need something, poof. He's not a bellhop. Call on the phone. Hey, bring me up ham and eggs. And all of a sudden there's a knock at the door and in comes the bellhop or whoever delivers the food into your motel room. But boom, but a bang. I prayed, God answered. There it is. Oh no. God's not like that at all. He wants to hear from us. Second of all is this. How serious are you about what you're praying for? How much of a burden is it really on your heart? You say, oh, pastor, we have people on our prayer list. You know, pastor, pray for this person's salvation. And I know there's some people that don't pray. They really don't. They could care less about the prayer list. But here's the point. There are some people that are burdened enough to pray what's on the prayer list because somebody in the church asked for that. So it's a burden on somebody's heart in the church. But woe be to that person that puts something on a prayer list on Wednesday and does not pray for it themselves. You say, what do you mean, Pastor? I'm at home praying for something because you're burdened about it. I don't know these people. And you're not praying for them? Something's wrong. I'll tell you what's wrong. You don't have a passion for prayer. Do you really believe that God is going to heal this person, fix this person, change that circumstance, help that person, meet their needs? Do you really believe that? And if you really believe that, you pray. You pray. So let's get into this idea of asking, ask, seek, and not. So number one in our prayer life is to ask. That seems pretty fundamental, does it not? I mean, if you're not going to ask, God's not going to answer. So we have to ask. We have to verbalize our requests. And let me say this. When you pray, be specific. Don't pray, Lord, bless the pastor. I'm already blessed. Just having Jesus Christ as my Savior is blessing enough for me. Amen. I remember when I first got saved, and I know I've said this in the past, when I first got saved, I was so excited about being saved, I said, Lord, I'm willing to live in a tent in the backyard till you come. 
I've changed my mind since then. <laughs> <laughs> so Lord, the Lord said, I got something better than that. You don't want to live in the tent. I'm going to send you to Pasco, Rhode Island. Where's that? Is that even on a map? Yes, it is. Of course it is. And it's become our home. So we need to realize that we have to be specific. Don't just pray, God bless the pastor. Pray, Father, give them the words. Give them clarity of thought. Help them to put together some things that I need in my life. Help them to expound the scriptures better. Help them have patience with all those other people in the church. <laughs> <laughs> Lord, help them have the strength to carry on and do whatever it is that he does all day. By the way, Lord, what does he do all day? <laughs> uh, watch Oprah. There's always something to do. So, uh, we have to ask. We have to ask. So let me give you five aspects of asking. Number one is this. There should be no selfish request. None. James chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. You ask and you receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your own lusts. So number one is this. We shouldn't be asking for something to consume on our lusts, our desires. Now, I don't mean the desires of the heart for somebody to be saved or come to Christ or somebody is uh, burdened in their life and so your desire is that they would be unburdened. But here, what Paul or what uh, James is talking about is lust. This is what I want. So you pull up in the parking lot, and you're a Foxwoods, and you put your arms on the steering wheel and say, Lord, help me to win tonight when I go to the Foxwoods. That would be a prayer God's not going to answer. Just is not going to happen. So we cannot ask in a selfish way. Spiritually selfish, I'll put that in, uh, I guess, we can be spiritually selfish. We want people to be saved. I want people to uh, get through the difficult times in life. I want them to be better if they're sick. But no selfish prayers. This is what I want. Lord, you know, I've always wanted this. And God says, you, you don't really need that. You don't need that. Yeah, but Lord, I want it. Now, God, God is good. He'll give us our wants on occasion. All of you want cable now, don't you? When cable first came out, yeah, that no better not have it in their house. <laughs> My pastor, our pastor, uh, he preached against cable television because back in those days when it first came out, at least in New Jersey, there were no commercials you paid and it was programming and some of the programming was, it was not uh, conducive to Christian watching. And so he preached against it. Well, now, pretty much everybody has cable TV, or actually, it's been around so long, people are starting to cut the cable like I did. Say, you know what? I'll just get what comes through the antenna if I'm going to watch television. But no selfish requests. Here's number two James chapter one. To ask in faith. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God that gives to all men liberally and upbraids not, and it shall be given unto him. But let him ask in faith nothing wavering. For he that wavers is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not a man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double minded man is unstable in all his ways. By the way, the context of that, being unstable in all your ways, is not believing God will answer the prayer. Well, I'm praying it, but I don't really think God will answer this prayer. And we've all prayed that. We've all prayed that. Somebody is given a prayer request, and people in the back of their minds are thinking, I don't think God's going to answer that. And if we actually do pray, God says, I can't answer that prayer. You have to have enough faith. In fact, if you have enough faith, Jesus said to his disciples, 
You can pray that this mountain be moved, and guess what? The bulldozers will be there the next day moving that mountain. Don't think the mountain's going to rise up and something's going to happen, but something's going to come into play. And so we have to ask in faith, do you believe God answers prayer? Yes. Some of you do. Do you believe God answers prayer? Yes. yes. Of course you do. Now the question is, and I've already said it, if he really answers prayer, how passionate are you in your prayer life? That God really is going to do something. Now I don't know about you, but I'm going to confess something right now. I'm a man. <laughs> That's not what I'm going to confess. Have you ever been disappointed in prayer? Yes. I know I have. I have. I know my son went to college, Pensacola Christian College down in Florida. I think they put it as far away from any airport as possible, so he had to pay the highest dollar amount to fly to that place. But my prayer was diligently, Lord, lead him into a group of people that love the Lord and will help him grow and mature in his faith. That didn't happen. In fact, my son went through a difficult time, a dark time. In fact, if it wasn't for my wife, he would have been booted out. You're allowed 150 demerits a semester. How many do you get every semester? 150 or more. They had to know Pensacola back in those days. Because back in the day, they were real strict. I mean, girls went up one staircase, boys went up another staircase. They couldn't go in the same elevator together. It was just crazy. That's changed. So he'd get the merits. He shaved his head one semester. They said, white people can't shave their heads. He goes, what do you mean these students? He goes, they said they're black. That's a cultural thing. Talk about a double standard, huh? Yeah. So I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and I'm thinking for four years, God's not answering my prayer. You'd feel the same way too. But 20 years later, God's answered that prayer. Has he not? Amen. Now he attends church with his family every week. Every Wednesday night, he goes to help reconstruct the building over there in Putnam. And uh, so he's involved. But who wants to wait 20 years? I don't. I want to pray once. And it's done. Praying for our granddaughter. Lord, bring somebody into her life. She's going to work her life. Don't want to hire her. She's spiritually minded. But she's a kid, too. Who said something rude? Who said something about affecting kids? To volunteer to teach in vacation Bible school. Wait, come on. You're older than those kids. You can intimidate them. <laughs> Why are you intimidated by an eight-year-old? I don't know, Pastor. I don't know. Those kids are pretty scary. Come on. Yeah, there's some kids I'd like to... So, we need to pray in faith. And part of that faith is God might not answer the prayer today, or tomorrow, or next year. But God answers prayer. Amen. And should we give up? No. But do we? Yes. We need to keep praying. If you have kids that need Christ, keep praying every day of your life. And we've heard testimonies, and I've mentioned them in the past, people that have literally passed away, and the person they were praying for came to Christ after their passing. God is faithful. He answers prayer. Then the third thing is this. So if we're asking and we can't ask selfishly, we have to ask in faith. Here's the third thing. 1 John 3, 22 and 23. Whatsoever we ask, 
We receive of Him because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. If we expect God to answer prayer, we have to be obedient to Him. We can't be living in sin and then pray and expect God to get answer that prayer. We have to be obviously obedient to the Lord. Walk in the ways of the Lord that He may answer your prayers. Be obedient. Number four is this. It has to be according to God's will. First John. I got all this from Dave's uh, expose. <laughs> you know, I was thinking this morning, Dave, if it took you a year, and it did, to go through First John, if you did that with Revelation, the rapture would have happened years they been here, saying, the Lord, we're only in chapter 4. <laughs> But I said, we hear what do you say? <laughs> I deny that. Pray for Dave, apparently. <laughs> anyway. Uh, 1 John chapter 5, verses 14, 15. And this is the confidence that we have in him. If we ask anything according to his will, he will what? hear us. He will hear us. He will answer our prayers. So we have to ask according to God's will. Now part of our passionate prayer life is to see the will of God. What is God's will? So that's obvious when it comes to righteous living. That's obvious in the Bible. It says not to gossip. Okay, I better not be a gossip. It says not to be a a whoremonger, or a liar, or a cheater, or a thief. Okay, well that seems self-evident. But what, what's God's will in your life? It could be, for us it was to move. You know, we grew up in New Jersey. We actually thought it was normal to be in New Jersey. We didn't know it was New Jersey. <laughs> we didn't know that. And then God said, no, I want you to go to Bible college. Well, Lord, you know, I'm 30 years old, and, you know, at 30, you, you're kind of out of the college scene. And God constantly impressed on me, you can't serve me without going to Bible college. And I tried. I tried. Uh, I mentioned it to uh, uh, TRW. I was going to say it, but TRW. I said, well, maybe because they had some advertisements and stuff. I said, well, maybe we get some... Or I just wanted to serve God in a physical way because I got the gift of help. So I want to want hands on. I want to do something. And so the Lord said, "No, no, no, no." He said, "I want you to go to Bible college and finally surrender to go because that was God's will. That was God's will for me to go." And so I went. And of course, prayers got answered. What kind of prayers? Now, Lord, we need money. I'm not working anymore. And he answered prayer. Not as quickly as I would have liked. Those were lean years, were they not? Lean, lean. You say, how lean were they? Oh, what? Probably weighed 110, 105. I don't know. They were lean years. years. But they were good years. They were good years. There was some trouble, though. Like when your landlord stuffs pornography in your mailbox because you're a Christian. Yeah, that's kind of landlord we had. It lived right behind us, in the house behind us. Yeah. Yeah, that was interesting. Number five is this. That we have to abide in Christ. There's the if factor in John chapter 15, the Lord's Prayer. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you. You shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. We have to abide in Christ. So, we can't ask selfishly. We have to ask in faith. We have to be obedient to God's calling and God's will. We have to ask according to His will. And of course, we need to abide in Christ. That's to get an answer to prayer. But we want a passionate prayer life. Not just the rote memory, here's my list. i got to be at work in 10 minutes. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. To get along with God and to begin to pray. And if we're really passionate, I assure you what's going to happen is you're going to spend more time in prayer and it's going to seem like less. 
It's not going to be the drudgery it once was. It's going to be something you look forward to. So Jesus said, ask, but then he went right on to say this in verse number 9, ask it shall be given unto you to seek, and you shall find. Well, what are we supposed to seek? Well, I'll tell you what the Bible says, seek the Lord. Seek his kingdom first of all. That's what we're supposed to seek. Isaiah 55, 6, seek ye the Lord while he may be found, call upon him while he may, uh, while he is near. So we're supposed to seek the Lord. We're seeking after the Lord in prayer. But on the back side of that, we're also seeking what God is leading us to if he wants us to answer that prayer. And that brings us to the last point. That's not. Not that it shall be open unto you. So we're seeking God's will. We're seeking God's wisdom. We're seeking God's working. We're seeking God's solution. And if he leads us to a door... We're supposed to knock and it will be opened unto us because he led us to that door. So many times, as I said, our prayers are reactive. Oh Lord, this happened, this happened. I can't believe what happened. And the Lord said, pray this way. Lord, don't lead me into temptation. Keep me from the evil one. Help me to live for you and to be the man of God you want me to be or be the woman of God you want me to be. Allow me to be a light in a dark world. Use me as an empty vessel. Help me to surrender myself to your will. All of that is proactive, not reactive. Now, none of us pray daily or give us this day our daily bread. We usually just jump on our cars and go to the store, right? But after the food is put before us on the table, then's the time to say, Lord, thank you. Thank you for what you've allowed me to do. Because there are many people in this world that have no food, but you do. So is your prayer life passionate? How passionate is your prayer life? So when the Lord said, here's how I want you men to pray and women, but there were 12 men before him. He said, first of all, glorify God. Hallowed be thy name. Holy is your name. Father, you are high and lifted up. Isaiah said, your train fills the temple. How glorious you are with the seraphim around you and a rainbow over your throne. How wondrous you are as you show yourself as Ezekiel says, a wheel within a wheel with eyes that surround that wheel. How glorious you are. So we could go on and on like that. But really, most times I say, Father, I'm hurting. My heart hurts. I pray for my kids and I name them and I pray for them and my grandkids. I got one right here, Jackson. I want Jackson to be a man of God. Amen. I want him to grow up and love the Lord Jesus. I want him to marry some woman that wants to share in the ministry like my wife does. She gives me all my sermons. <laughs> <laughs> so here's what I want us to do. This is a corporate prayer. Our Father, give us, forgive us, Lead us, not into temptation. That's a corporate prayer. What I want us to do is to collectively pray as a church that God will work in our midst, take care of the difficulties that people have, but that the Spirit of God would move among us, that we may grow. Some people need to grow in their faith. Some people need to come to faith in our church. Some people need to understand what it means to live the Christian life. And it's not all external, it's truly all internal. So we need to collectively say, Father, when you're done with your list, praying for your kids or your grandkids or whatever else you're praying for, or the church list, you pray for the church. Say, Father, our pastor's been praying for two years now faithfully that a young couple would come and have a heart to reach teenagers. Amen. I don't mean just doing activity on Friday night. 
I mean a husband and a wife that have a heart for teenagers. Now you begin to pray because I've already been praying and I'll tell you what, I figured after the first time, okay, Lord, must be your will. Because you're not willing any should perish, but all should come to repentance. There you go, Lord. Silence. So let's all begin to pray for that. Amen? Amen. Begin praying now for the vacation Bible school. My grandson made a profession of faith last year and think up well, two years ago on vacation Bible school. Something happened last year. I don't know what it was. <laughs> I don't know what happened last year. Some COVID thing came around. I want other kids to accept Christ. So does Jesus. So let's pray about that as a church. I want to see the hand of God move among us in ways that we can recognize. I want us to walk into the building and sense the presence of God. I want us to know that God is alive and well. In a, I mean, we know He's alive and well. But in a way that says, God is moving in New Hope Baptist Church in the middle of Pasco, Rhode Island. Amen. You see, God can only work in major cities. I like to see him build a mega church out here. Amen. Not downward throw crowded. Out in the middle of nowhere. That I suppose if you preach well enough, maybe you could. But it's not a question of preaching, it's a question of God's moving. 